My name is Celeste Ellen Wickepin, and later this year I'll be hyphenating my last, my blood name, which is McLean, so then I'll be Celeste Ellen Wickepin McLean. And I am 18 years old, and today's April 27th, 2008. I'm doing this at the StoryCorps booth in Sacramento, California. And I'm interviewing my grandpa Roy, um, and my dad's here to interject too, Kevin Wickepin. Okay, and my name is Kevin Wickepin, and I am 60 years old. Today is April 27th, 2008, and the location is Sacramento, since that's where we are, and my daughter is Celeste. My name is uh, Roy W. Williams. My age is 80. Mm -hmm. uh, today's date is April the 27th, 2008. We are in Sacramento, California. My relationship to Celeste is I am her honorary <laughs> grandfather. Which makes him my dad's friend. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, Kevin's friend. And since, Kev and since uh, Celeste had no grandparents, I have the great honor, and believe me, it's one of the greatest honors I've ever had in my <laughs> life, to be chosen as her adopted or honorary grandfather. It's kind of where I wanted to start the interview today is I wanted to ask how you met dad and how you ended up being my grandpa. Well let's see we met I, uh, he was a he had a, he was a pen artist he drew a lot of pen <laughs> drawings and um, uh, that name well, let's see no he had told me his name was Wikipen. But then when I saw the drawings, it was McLean, wasn't it? McLean or? No, I don't Ma think so, but. Ma Ma it was something. No, 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 no. You, you said your name was McLean, but when I saw the paintings, it, it said Wikipen. Well, I just had never heard that name before, but that's uh, unusual because it turned out his stepfather came from my hometown and his <laughs> check. And I didn't realize that Wikipen was a Czech name, well, there's only, but it is. Yeah. But because I since went in a, a visited to my hometown, saw two Wikipens in the phone book, yeah, one of the which few are places. related to him. Yeah, there's only um, we're the only family of Wikipens in California, and all the rest of them live in Texas, and that's where Grandpa Roy's from originally. So right, there's a connection there. And so you traveled a lot with Dad, right? Oh yes, I've, I've, I've traveled a lot, uh, not as much as I'd like to, but uh, I spent three and a half months in Europe mm -hmm. in 1958. Yeah, in Spain. Just, did, you, did you travel with my dad at all when you guys met? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, let's see, there was one occasion when, uh, since he's a school teacher, gets off three months every year. So I think it was 83, uh, he took off in I told him to go through Texas and visit my cousins, which he did. Then he went on to visit his friend in Atlanta, Georgia, that he went to school with, a doctor mm -hmm. who worked at the, what do you call that place? Um, Centers for Disease Control. And then uh, Dr. Farley? I flew mm -hmm. to Washington, D.C., and he picked me up at the Dulles, Air, Dulles Airfield, Airport. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we had a very nice trip, a uh, visit in Washington, D.C., where we met this school teacher from Boston who invited us to the 4th of July uh, concert in Boston. But unfortunately, I was supposed to fly back from New York. But after visiting Washington, we drove to New York, and Kevin is a, a genius at uh, getting things done. <laughs> and uh, I tried to change my plane to fly back from Boston, but Kevin was able to accomplish it for me. So I went on to Boston with him, and we had a wonderful time at that concert with the uh, Boston Pops, conducted Ooh, by John Williams. Oh, no wow. relation to me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish? We'd all be rich and forever. The, and, the, and when they played the 1812 Overture, the cannons were right behind us. Ooh. And I think they miscued, didn't they? <laughs> Probably <laughs> they didn't quite. Well, there was off there was there must have been two hundred and fifty thousand people <laughs> well, there. there. One hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, it was just people. incredible. Yeah, it That's was amazing. incredible. So, so, did you find out you were going to be my grandpa before or after I was born? Oh, after. Oh yeah, after. Okay. I mean, but what year did you meet my dad? 
76. So you knew him long oh, before I, I was long born. Long before, yes. Uh-huh. And so then after I was born, how did he ask you? Well, uh, I think both he and your mother asked me. He says, since uh, Celeste has no grandfathers, we'd be glad, we'd be honored that you would be her grandfather, which uh, is one of the happiest things that's ever happened to me. <laughs> me too. Thank you very much for saying that. I'm yes. so proud of her. Oh. <laughs> so the other thing that you wanted to talk about, another one was a memory that you had with Dad about meeting John Glenn. Oh, yes. This was this trip to Washington, D.C. We uh, went to the Capitol. Well, well, no, first we went to the... Um, Air, Air and Space Museum. Mm-hmm. And Kevin bought a painting of Saturn, the planet Saturn. Then we went over to the Capitol and uh, we wanted to go to the Senate, so we had to go over to the, the <laughs> bill. We had to go over to the Senate office to our congressman to get a ticket. And Senator Inouye, the famous one from the uh, Nixon uh, uh, Watergate thing. He was in the same buggy with us, our little cart, that mm-hmm. little train that went under the ground to the, to the over to the office. So when we got out and we started to go to the elevators, as this elevator said, senators only. Well, Senator Inouye was waiting there, and he, he motioned for us to go into the elevator. And I said, oh, that's for the senators only. And Senator Inouye says, I'm a senator, and I'm inviting you in. (laughs) You pay my salary. (laughs) Nice. Smart man. And so we got our, and we went in, and John Glenn happened to be, he's a senator, and he happened to be on the floor of the Senate. So we went into the Senate, uh, well, it was the bet where where they, uh, sort of a vestibule, reception reception area, hall. And we asked the lady, was it possible that we could meet John Glenn? And she says, oh, certainly. I'll get him right off the floor. We said, well, that's not necessary. We can wait. She said, oh, no, no problem. So within a minute or two, here comes John Glenn into the, there. And he was extremely gracious and friendly. And he signed his, uh, he autographed yeah, his. Yeah, I didn't uh, have a piece of paper, so I said, here, sign the frame on this picture. Signed, he signed that picture that he bought of uh, Saturn, which is still hanging and, in our in our bathroom of all places. With a little, <laughs> it has a little snapshot of John Glenn shining or signing the the picture frame too. Yeah, we took pictures, mm-hmm. and then also I had some uh, connection because when he orbited the Earth in the Mercury capsule, I knew a woman who knew the artist who drew, painted it. And I sent first day covers back to be autographed by John Glenn. And I had one uh, autographed uh, first cover. The postage stamp. Postage stamp. And so that was, uh, it was very, um, I was glad to see that that was his actual signature. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you need to tell her about how we alerted the Secret Service when you were walking down the hall. Oh. Well, I fell. Mm-hmm. I accidentally fell down. <laughs> and uh, you have a goodness, talent for this. They had everybody. The, at the there was such a there that, was such a clatter. <laughs> he knocked uh, uh, the stanchions over, and oh, there was this huge clatter. And suddenly, out of all the doors, these armed fellows <laughs> came out. It was like, oh God, we're going to be dead here. <laughs> Anyway, that was that was an interesting yeah. experience. Oh, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. So the other memory that I wanted you to share, this is the surprise one, um, was your favorite story of me when I was a kid. And you said you thought about it on the train. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah I thought about it on the train. Now, I think this happened in 1992, okay. before you were two years old. Uh, you and your mother came to Hawaii to mm-hmm. spend a week with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, we rented a car, and also our friend Bruce and his father came. So we were, I went out to the car, and they put Celeste in the back seat, and she was sitting there. Mind you, she's less than two years old. <laughs> and she said, I'm frustrated. <laughs> right then I knew she was a precocious girl. What was I frustrated she was about? Le- I don't know. You just all of a sudden you said, "I'm frustrated," <laughs> which is some uh, 
quite a word to come from a less than two year old. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. I have, everybody has stories of me like that when I was a kid. That you know, I was always saying things like, I am perfectly capable of doing this for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we could talk a little bit more about you. Um, you were born right before the Great Depression. You yes. said. Yeah, I call myself a DNA, DND person. Mm -hmm. I was born two years before the coll collapse in 1929. That's the Depression, starting of the Depression. And then I started to school at the beginning of the New Deal, <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, which eventually brought us out of the Depression. I think the war kind of helped. Yeah. But anyway, I'm a D&D &D person, generation. Oh. <laughs> And then we wanted to talk about um, your experience with the army and going to Japan. Oh, yeah. And well, the Mikado and the emperor and all those cool stories. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just, I won't tell the first part of that, but I ended up being sent to Japan in 1946 in July. Well, no, no, we left the first day of August to mm -hmm. go to Japan. And Is it really hot there? Oh, it was hot, yeah, before we got there out, out to sea because we had to sleep on the deck. It was so hot. Huh. But anyway, I got about, it took about a week, but I got assigned to general headquarters in Tokyo. And I worked in General MacArthur's headquarters. And uh, I think uh, I was very, I think I've seen things that not too many people have seen because at that time the International Tribunal of the Far East was going on. This was where they were trying the war, Japanese war criminals, Tojo and all the rest. And I was fortunate enough to attend the trial one day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, close to the first part of November, uh, they adopted their new constitution and the emperor and empress came out. What did they look like? Well like the emperor and empress, you know. Were they short well, or they, were they tall? Well, they were in a, they come in a carriage, you know, mm -hmm. from the moat, across a moat, mm -hmm. and uh, on to this stand. And we happened to be almost directly in front of the emperor mm -hmm. and just, oh, maybe 20 or 30 feet away. Wow. And there was a huge crowd of Japanese. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he came, they started hollering bands, bonsai, and the whole crowd just starts surging forward. And all the cameras were on ladders back of us, mm -hmm. and they just knocked them right down. Oh, my God. Yeah. What did, what did he wear? Did she wear a kimono, or did they wear, like, Western clothes? Oh, yeah, well, she had a kimono on, as I remember. But he, he had a regular suit, kind of like a tuxedo-looking. That's amazing. Yeah. And then... Um, just really briefly, could you tell me about seeing the Mikado for the first time? Oh, yes. Uh, well, I, when I was there, the first production of the Mikado ever given in Japan. Which is the Gilbert and Sullivan Opera. The, the Gilbert and Sullivan Opera. Because it was banned before the war because uh, uh, it made fun of the emperor. Mm -hmm. you know, And so it was put on by a joint uh, venture between uh, the armed services and the Japanese theatrical mm -hmm. company. And it was in the Takarashu Theater, which is a huge theater, which we had taken over and called the Ernie Pyle Theater. <laughs> what a name change. And it was a lavish production. I've wow. never seen anything like it. That's amazing. And I still have the program from that. Hmm. And it's... The Takarashu Theater is right across the street from the Imperial Hotel, which Frank Lloyd Wright designed mm -hmm. just before the 1923 earthquake, mm -hmm. and it survived the earthquake. Good architect. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, and this was something, this is a funny story for me. Um, I was coming out to my family as, as, as a bisexual woman uh, when I was about 13, and I was really sensitive about it, and I was really scared. And I kept accusing mom and dad of being homophobic. I kept saying, you just hate me, you know, because I'm not straight, and you're just homophobic. And mom and dad kept saying, no, we're not, no, we're not, no, we're not. And I was like, 
well, yeah, you are, yeah, you are. And and finally they said, well, you have to understand that we have we have people who are very close to us who are gay. How could we be homophobic? I said, yeah, tell me one person in, in my whole life that's gay. And they said, well, hadn't you ever realized that Grandpa Roy? <laughs> and I just busted up laughing. I thought that was the funniest thing in the world because, you know, you're my grandpa, so I don't ever think about it. But I kind of wanted to ask about your experience of, of that as, as a young adult. Oh boy! If it's that, not, if that's that not, is, that is uh, really overly a really, loaded, uh, complicated story. <laughs> uh, oh gosh! Uh, it's okay if you don't want to talk about it. I'm not it. even just... sure I am. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would that'd be a long, that'd complicated be a long story. story. Well, I just wanted to yeah. say thank you because you were really inspirational to me at a really hard time in my life. Because whether you're gay or straight, I don't care at all. Well, this but, was news to me, what you just said about yourself. Oh. <laughs> I never knew this before either. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's not something I advertise a lot. But, mm. um, but like, you were really inspirational to me at a really hard time. Because um, it was really hard for me to, to be living in the community that I'm living in, which yeah. is a really small community. Um, and to be and to be trying to like establish my identity, and so like even though I never talked to you about it, like I always really looked up to you and was like, well, you know, Grandpa Roy is this really cool person, mm -hmm. and he's maybe had to deal with his identity too, and I always knew that my parents loved you so much, and that because you weren't my 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 blood grandpa, I knew that Dad had had to have been really good friends with you, um, and that had that had been a choice for him, and mm -hmm. so I knew that. It, he didn't just keep loving me because I was his daughter. Mm. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, well, I love you because you're my daughter, and so I couldn't hate you even if you were a lesbian or something like that. Like, I knew that because he'd chosen, to be, chosen you to be one of his best friends and to be my grandpa, that he was always going to accept me mm -hmm. and that he was always going to love me because he loved you. Oh, and right. so it was just really meaningful to me. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring that well, up. I'm sorry if it was I'm uncomfortable. Glad about that. Okay. Okay. So is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Anything you wanted to ask me? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I won't tell you to tell me more about your uh, uh, wanting to be an opera singer. <laughs> um, well, oh gosh. Okay, so I'm going to school next year probably to study classical voice. Um, and that's because um, I really love, well, I almost studied music theater instead but opera is like a really like you have to train your voice so much more mm -hmm. and it's like almost ethereal when mm -hmm. opera singers sing yeah, right. um it's it's like not even like they're human anymore and so i really want to be able to access that with my voice mm -hmm. um and i know that your favorite opera is carmina barana right well that's not an opera it's not an it's opera an oratorio but, <laughs> but it is one of my favorites what do you but, like about it oh i just like the music uh, the 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 singing and uh, oh, it's just fantastic. I think. Yeah. But uh, I am kind of a amateur person you know, when it comes to opera. I mm -hmm. like opera, not all opera, just <laughs> some opera. And um, I had a nice experience with my Canadian friend who was a great buff. Uh, mm -hmm. This was Don Roberts, and uh, he uh, he invited me to go on a tour of. Uh, of the Eastern Bloc countries when they were still communist. Wow. It was an opera and concert tour. And we left from Toronto, Canada, and went to uh, to Warsaw, Poland wow. first. Did you go to Russia and stuff and see opera there? Well, we there? didn't go to Russia, but uh -huh. we went to Warsaw, Poland. We saw, mm -hmm. on this tour, we saw an opera or a concert every night. <laughs> and the, after we left Warsaw, we drove to East Berlin, which was still mm -hmm. communist, yeah. and then we went over into West Berlin one night for an opera, and then we went on to Dresden, Germany, mm -hmm. and then on to Prague, Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Where and I was very, uh, from. I was uh, very uh, thrilled to, to go to Prague because I was raised with Czech people. There's mm -hmm. a lot of Czech people in Texas, <laughs> as uh, Kevin knows, because he's he's from 
his folks. Well, my, my, my father, my adoptive father. Oh, oh his adopted father, that's right. right. Was that's from, a funny from my whole Texas. town. Yeah. yeah. Just, well, that was a funny thing about me is that I got a check. I got check blood from my mom. I got a bunch of Czechoslovakian blood from my mom, so I'm blonde haired and blue eyed with big cheekbones. And then I got oh. a check name from my dad, even though he's not Czechoslovakian at oh, all. Oh, so, so your mother does have some. Mm-hmm. I my didn't know Czech. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It shows up in all the women in our family. Yeah. That's really neat. Um, I have a story about Carmina Burana, um, because Dad kept saying that it was your favorite, your favorite oratory, your favorite stage show of opera singing, Mm. Um, and we went and saw it in the Boboli Gardens in Florence. I don't know if we ever told you about that. Yeah, you mentioned it recently. Yeah, Mm. it was. It's those beautiful gardens that they have, like the statues and these amazing sculpted hedges, Mm. and there was this beautiful outdoor amphitheater. Um, just like tears and tears of people in this huge orchestra, and we and we watched Carmina Burana, mm-hmm. um, and, and and it was just like it was like fairyland. There was all these gold lights in the trees, and it was just really beautiful. And um, and I thought about you the whole time. I was like, oh, Grandpa yeah. Roy should be here. You should yeah. see this. It's his I've favorite. I've seen. I've I've heard it many times. How many times uh, have you seen Evita? Uh, twenty-three. Twenty-three. Yeah, I saw oh it 23 times on the stage. <laughs> How many times have you seen Carmina Burana? Oh, maybe a dozen. About a dozen, I'd So, say. like, you've devoted your I life to... I used to go to... every time it came around the Bay Area. Yeah. But uh, I still go in every chance I get. <laughs> Occasionally they dance it, you know, it's a ballet, oh, as a ballet. Wow. It's that quite would be good. It's intense. Done that way. Mm-hmm. No, that the that beginning would be really intense. I think I can share just a little story about one of the things that I, the reason that we chose Roy to be your grandpa mm-hmm. was when I first met him, he was, I, I was pretty, well, I was 20, uh, I can see, I don't know how old I was at the time, 20 years, let's well, see, it says it was 1976, however old I was then, Same. and, um, uh, and uh, I had been out of school, uh, graduated from UC Santa Barbara, and and was working. Yeah, actually, I'd just gotten my job up in uh, Sonora uh, as a counselor. And anyway, and then I met Roy and in the city. I don't recall exactly. And uh, uh, how? Did, how? It, like, how did you meet him? Like, you just ran into him on the street? Something, or? something along those lines. No, I think it was a, a exhibit of his uh, art. Well, in, in any case, uh-huh, yeah. uh, uh, once, once, and we we kept in contact with each mm-hmm. other. And uh, and as as time went by. Uh, Roy was one of the most generous people because I had never had anybody really generous in my life, <laughs> and and he was always giving me things, yeah. uh, recordings <laughs> of things that he thought I might enjoy. He was always taking me out to dinner, and I you know I didn't have a lot of money at that time, and Roy was working full time for Scene Eight Sugar, so you know I think he was had had enough money to entertain that way, and uh, and it was always. I was always struck by his generosity, that he was just such a generous person with his time, his energy, his thoughtfulness, and and his gifts. And I always just thought that was so cool. And that was just one of the things that, uh, and I also knew him to have a really good heart because he was a really kind person. (laughs) And so that's... I'm blushing. (laughs) <laughs> it's, good. it's okay. It, it really came through too. Um, like, so I remember when I was little, like Grandpa would drive up all the time. Like he'd come up, like I don't know, you came up like once every couple months at the very least. And I mean, and and you have to understand that Grandpa Roy lives in Concord, and that's about two and a half, three hours away um, from where we live. So it wasn't just no big deal. And he'd come up, and I was just the most spoiled grandkid I, I've ever known. Like, he just would bring this and that, and I have, like, a whole selection of nutcrackers from him for Christmas, and I have teapots that just come out my ears. They have this one really cute And then cute finally one. they put a stop to that. Yeah. Said, Enough of that stuff. Enough. No more. We have no I, more room in our home. Because I, no I had closets full of these teapots. I just I, love to spoil her. Yeah. My favorite was this little um, teapot that was all these... Because you have to understand, Grandpa Roy um, has lots of cats. And I had two cats when I was little. They were my favorite pet. And so Grandpa brought this teapot that's a blue striped couch. Um, and the spout, I forget what the spout is, but like the, the handle is a floor lamp next to the couch. And the little top that you take off to pour water into it to make tea is a little cat sitting on top of the couch. And there's all these cats on this little blue striped couch. And it was my favorite teapot that Grandpa ever brought me. So... But he was. He was really generous with his time and 
and just wonderful. So thank you very much for it's it's a really wonderful thing. It's a really great honor to me to have you in my life and to know that that you loved me um, so much and enough to to be my grandpa, even when I didn't really have one. Um, I can't really explain that other than it's just a great honor and that well, I love you a it's lot. It's mutual. <laughs> the honor is mutual. I tell you, <laughs> I couldn't you. have I couldn't ask for a better or more beautiful or talented <laughs> granddaughter. Thank you. And kind and sweet. <laughs> Gee, yeah, it, it's lies. It's all lies. Don't listen to no, it's true. <laughs> Thank it's you. all true. Thank you, Grandpa. So. I love you so much, Celeste. I love you too, Grandpa. I was really, really happy you came to do this because Dad said you guys were, we were going to do this, and, and he asked me if there's anybody I wanted to interview, and I immediately said, I want to interview Grandpa because um, you just have so much like so much wisdom and knowledge, and, and you've, you've been oh around for a while. and. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. One of the things that you haven't talked about, Roy, is your interest in photography. And I don't think oh. Celeste knows anything about it. I don't know anything yeah. about Oh, you don't? Well, no. you know, when I finished uh, the Army, got out of the Army, we had what they call the GI Bill of Rights, which they oh, paid yeah. your way to whatever school you wanted I to go to. remember that, yeah. So I had become very Industry. interested in photography through a classmate of mine, my good friend, mm -hmm who like, got me interested in photography, so I decided to become a professional photographer. So I went to Southwest Photo Arts Institute in Dallas, Texas for a year and a half, and I have a diploma in portrait, uh, portraiture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I never went into that business because my temperament was that uh, I want to please everybody. And that's one business you can't please everybody. <laughs> Almost well, nobody's yeah, happy yeah. when you take pictures of them. Happy, Either but one. but he still does it. Like he he still brings out a camera at like every dinner table. And Dad and I both hate having our pictures taken. It's like you should have seen at lunch today. He's he's whipping out his little digital camera, and <laughs> and Dad was making faces at the camera, and I was hiding, throwing up and, his hands. Yeah. <laughs> but then now, mm -hmm. uh, since I've retired, I've, and since the digital photography era has a, a is upon us yeah. I got interested in digital photography so I bought me a nice digital camera before I went to China mm -hmm. Japan and China and I took about 2,000 pictures in in China mm -hmm. and uh, now at this I belong to the senior center in Concord yeah that's something and now I'm the photographer for their newsletter Cool. So I take all the pictures. For Is them. that that's you're saying you you've become really so active now with I'm, them? I'm, I'm I'm doing a lot of uh, work with Photoshop elements for Ooh. you know yeah. touching up <laughs> making fantasies and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you should so email I'm, us some of your work. Oh yeah. okay, I yeah. just did one yesterday. The moonflower. Yes, oh, well neat. send that to us. Yeah, okay, really I made funny. a moonflower fantasy. Well, thank you. I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, words really fall short for me when I try to express how I feel. Me too. To, to have you here. Yeah. I, I just feel like there's this empty space. Like, there's something more I should say to tell you how grateful I am or how much I love you. Because it it's just means so much. And then I just, I can't, I can't get it to come out. <laughs> what are some words. of the things you've learned from your grandpa? Oh, my gosh. Um... <laughs> Uh, with the generosity, like the the good things and the uh, the bad things, both to be um, so much. He's been so generous with me, and, and it makes me want to just commit these little random acts of kindness all the time oh, in my yeah. life. Um, and uh, oh, gosh, well, you, you know, I heard that from your mother, random acts of kindness. So yeah. that's kind of my philosophy now. Yeah, I'm do I I like to do things for people. And right now I'm uh, uh, taking pictures of, of people, the seniors, and taking all the wrinkles out of their faces. And, <laughs> and they're making them real happy. <laughs> well, the other thing I learned um, from Grandpa is that, like, that you can look dignified into your, I don't want to say old age, because I don't think my grandpa is old yet, but, but he's old enough to have white hair and a white beard. And... Um, and he always looks so dignified and crisp and clean and nice. Like even I, like his nails are much more pretty than mine oh, right no. now. <laughs> and so like, 
it just it made me feel a lot better about what it's going to be like when I get older because I thought I can look crisp and, and dignified and handsome and pretty all the way till I'm 81. Oh, so man, what a compliment! <laughs> Dress is nice. I'll tell you. But, uh, and not yeah, to drive never... when you fall asleep, because I remember Grandpa fell asleep at the wheel once when I was little, and it scared me so bad I thought I'll never drive when I'm going to sleep ever yeah. again. They took my license away for three months, too. Oh, Almost that was three months. Oh. That was probably one of the hardest things we ever did because we were so worried, you know. I mean, yeah. and, and we knew yeah. that it would cause a terrible event in your life if, you know, <laughs> I didn't know it would do what it did. But we just thought, you know, we've got to do something because you were falling well, they, asleep. Well, they made and, me go to uh, the uh, emergency up there. Yeah. And, of course, they had to report it to the DMV. Which we didn't so know at the time. So they suspended and... my driver's oh, license. Geez. I had to go I had to go take all kinds of tests at Kaiser. <laughs> to get her back. Oh, for I'm that. sorry, Grandpa. But they turned out that there was nothing wrong. Yeah, well, yeah. that was good I didn't good have in that anything way. serious. It was just that I was staying up till 3 o'clock yeah. every night <laughs> just on the computer. Just like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, I don't really regret doing it. Oh, t- okay. And um, you also should spend a little bit of time talking about your mother because she lived with you for quite a long time, didn't she? And, oh, yeah. And I thought she was uh-huh. a, a really cantankerously interesting <laughs> character. <laughs> Yeah, my mother, uh, well, my mother and father moved out here from Texas in 1962. But my dad had already had a heart attack. And uh, he had worked in uh, coal mines when he was young, so he had emphysema. So uh, he only lived about a year, a little over a year. And uh, he passed away in 63. Well, then my mother, they were living at my house, so then my mother was living with me, and she lived until 76 with, no, 78. Yeah, 78. I, I knew her for a little yeah, while. Yeah, 78, and then she, I put her in her own apartment, you know, which was only about hey. two blocks from my house, and uh, she had congestive heart failure, oh, and, and the doctors told me, Years before she finally passed away, that you better prepare because she's going to go any minute, which I did. I, you know, I paid for her funeral about 25 years before (laughs) she finally died. (laughs) But and she lived to be almost 97. Yeah, there you go. You got it in your almost 97, and her mother lived to be 95. I just had a memory that came up. I wish I would have brought it with me. I wrote this poem that I got to read on TV that was about Grandpa's apartment. Oh. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but I wrote I, or Grandpa's house down in Concord, oh. and I wrote this poem about it on TV. And a memory that absolutely shouldn't go unrecorded here is making crepes oh. with my Grandpa. Oh, <laughs> my yeah. Grandpa was the first person who ever taught me about crepes um, when he had one of those. You had one of those cool uh, yeah, little crepe machine. Yeah, you dip yeah, it in little. Electric skillet. Yeah. Yeah. And those they're just the best. And so in my poem, I talk about um, the smell of crepes and cologne in the air and how the sunlight dappled the lawn in the front. And I always had plastic toy animals when I was a kid. I never had action figures of people. I always had animals. Um, and and, da- and Grandpa's front yard was just the coolest place in the world to play with, with toy animals. He had, like, this, this tall grass and these beautiful trees. And so I just have the fondest memories when I was little of visiting your house, Grandpa, um, and of making crepes with sugar and lemon. And, and I remember how many times we made crepes. Yeah. Every time I went up, I yeah. would bring my crepe yeah. pan and... It was a big we tradition. Would, we would make crepes for breakfast. Oh, yeah. But, that, you know, they were actually Swedish pancakes, <laughs> that Sometimes. recipe, because my one of my great nephews married a Swedish girl. Oh. <laughs> and she taught us how to make Swedish pancakes. But they looked like crepes. Yeah. And well, they basically just, they're crepes. Yeah. It, he, that's another thing Grandpa taught me was how to eat crepes with, with lemon and sugar, and that has and we served made, me well my whole life. all kinds of crepes, oh. didn't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All kinds. They're just the best. But I've got some pictures of us making crepes. I know. We yeah. do, too. We have that one of me yeah. in that awful little, like, jean jumper outfit <laughs> on a on a stool because I was too short to do the crepes on the on the counter when I was little. So. So. All right. Um, one of the...
other person I wanted maybe to touch on briefly was Bruce. I just wanted to know, for posterity's sake, what, what Bruce is your friend? Because I remember him a lot yeah. from when I was little. Oh, yeah, Bruce is an Indonesian. Okay, yeah. And, yeah very good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. In fact, he came over with his father that time you came to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I just I remember his face a lot, and I, I'd really like to see him again. So maybe yeah. maybe you could put us oh, in touch yeah. with him because yeah, I, I miss him. I know you used to call him Uncle Bruce. Uncle Bruce, because he's like a, a feature of my childhood. Yeah, so. right. That'd be yeah, really they neat. they went back to Indonesia last year. Mm-hmm. He brought me a, a nice uh, wood carving. Yeah. What are I your mean, travel plans for the future for the summer? Do you, are you going anywhere special? Oh, I may go to Mexico. Ooh. Yeah, I want to go see uh, Arturo, my friend Arturo. Mm-hmm. Because he went back as soon as we got back from China, and he hasn't been back since 2005. So, and is there any place th- you haven't traveled that you want to travel to? Oh, many, many places. What you know what's two or three? You know what's uh, kind of fascinating to me now is Dubai. Have you read mm-hmm. about yeah. Dubai? Oh yeah, the place with that mega that that hotel thing. Well, they've got they they're building the tallest building in the mm-hmm. world there right now. But I'd like to go there, and then on the way, I would like to go to the Seychelles Islands. You've heard of those, mm-hmm. and then I want to go to Mauritius, uh, to uh, Madagascar, and Mauritius. And yeah. then I just recently read that Cape Town, South Africa, was a very interesting place. Now, have so you traveled in Africa back at all? There, I've been to Spanish Morocco, just uh, over from the Rock of Gibraltar, <laughs> Algeciras. I went to Tangiers and Tetuan. Say, say something in Spanish, because Grandpa also speaks really good Spanish, so you should put some Spanish something on here. Tell me about me being precocious and beautiful in Spanish. <laughs> yo soy tejano, porque yo he nacido en Texas, cerca de la frontera de México. Casi todos los gentes de allá pueden hablar el español. Sí. Mi, uh, uh, let's see... Hija grand, uh, grande. <laughs> I'm his fat daughter now. Mi español es uh, limitado. <laughs> sí. And uh, muy hermosa. Hermosa. Y, y, oh. Merci por tu Porque carácter. cuando yo estuve en España en 1958, Uy. mi amigo se ya se dice... No sé, gracias, sé, para los curas que lo ganan cantando misa. Sí. <laughs> gracias. Oh, no, hay um, de qué. I don't know. Um, je parle seulement français. Uh, c'est possible. Uh, Celeste speaks fluent French. Sí. Oui. oui. <laughs> Como grand-père. <laughs> Avec espagnol. <laughs> Uh, c'est per- parfait pour finir cette uh, interview uh, avec mon grand-père uh, en, France, en français, uh, espagnol. Um, le, toutes les langues um, est bien pour dire uh, que je, l'ai, uh, je l'aime bien, ma grand-père, mon grand-père. Um, je t'aime. Et oh. I love you. <laughs> no. Mi amor. Mi amor. <laughs> tu amor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, see, uh, Roy in French used to be the the way they spell king. Yeah. You know, it was. King, king, now they spell king. it R O I, but it was R O Y. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's my king, my queen grandpa. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Ta da! Ta da! It's fini. Fini. The fat lady sang.